I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us today for today's best practices webinar uh, on understanding hierarchical asset structures in CMMS. And um, before I introduce our uh, guest speaker today, uh, I just wanted to clarify because eMaint um, as a software provider, yes, we do a lot of webinars and a lot of different types of educational sessions, but I did want to clarify what our best practices sessions are, and they're really strategic concepts and industry best practices about how to solve different business problems. Um, this isn't a technical how-to training session. We offer those as well, along with product demonstrations. But for today's session, we're really going to be talking about the concepts and hopefully some concepts that you can apply, whether you're an email client or you know, considering a CMMS or already have a CMMS, uh, regardless of which one it is. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to today's guest speaker, and that's Gil Acosta. And um, I'm always really glad to have Gil with us. Gil, do you want to advance the slide and show the folks who you are? <laughs> and, sure, um, there you go. Okay, great. Thank you. And Gil is uh, our Director of Engineering Services, as you can see, and he's an uh, engineer by trade and been working in the industry, I think, over three decades. Uh, yep. I'm not afraid to admit that. <laughs> and um, so and I go way back. And he joined our team last year to kind of head up our Engineering Services team at eMaint. And um, as we mentioned, in addition to software, you know, many of our clients come to us wanting more than just learning how to push the buttons in the software, but really how to apply it to solve some of their business challenges. And Gil, while people are logging in, we had quite a few registrants today, so I guess not everybody's leaving early for uh, for Memorial Day, but maybe you can uh, tell me a little bit, Gil, about. I know this is a new session that you just put together, and why did you choose this topic? And uh, you know, why did you feel this one would be important to share with our listeners? Absolutely, thank you, Rona. So, welcome everyone. Uh, so, so this is maybe a, a new presentation for us in the webinars, but I, I, I can tell you that it's it's an old topic. Uh, it, it turns out that probably every time I sit with a client, that uh, the discussion always generally begins with what's the asset structure look like. Uh, it's it's such an underlying fundamental principle for a good CMMS uh, structure that uh, I sometimes forget that it's not necessarily an intuitive topic. So hence hence the webinar to try to shed some light, take the mystery away. It's really not all that difficult, uh, but I will tell you that it's sometimes challenging uh, when we start to sit down with, with at the client level. Uh, what does it mean to them? Uh, oftentimes we look for copy and paste solutions and uh, this is not one of them. This is one where you kind of take a guiding principle and apply it to uh, your situation. And your, your hierarchy may look very different from a next client's and they'll both be absolutely perfect and correct. So uh, that's what this is all about. Hopefully it sheds some light on the subject. Uh, you know, if you find yourself working with us, uh, my, myself or my team directly, you'll notice that we very quickly introduce this, uh, you know, it, it early in the discussion simply because it sets the foundation for everything else that we'll do in a CMMS environment. And it does certainly set the foundation for what you're going to do on your reliability journey. Great. Okay. It all starts with a foundation, I guess. Mm -hmm. So um, before I turn it over to Gil, who I know you all came to hear today, a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, we are recording today's session so that we can share it. We realize that uh, not everyone on your team uh, can always participate live. So we will um, record the session and share it with all of our listeners today. Also, Gil has agreed to um, stay through the end of the hour, if need be, and answer any questions you might have. But please feel free at any time during the presentation and uh, go into the control panel and type your question, and I'll be happy to uh, read it to Gil at the end of the session. Also, he is willing to, uh, we don't have too many slides today, we're really here to, Gil is here to share his thoughts and his experience, uh, but we're happy to make a PDF available to our listeners on request. Uh, and at the end of the session, there will be a little um, uh, survey that where you can request that. All right, so I know you didn't come to hear me today, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Gil. Okay, Rona, thank you. 
All right, so it looks like we have a pretty good group of folks out on the, on the line, so thank you for joining us. Uh, here's, here's, here's the simplicity of what I'm going to cover. Uh, just uh, what is it? What is a hierarchical asset structure? Why is it important and how do you begin? And of course, as Rona mentioned, there's going to be plenty of time at the end for, for Q&A. I promise you no death by PowerPoint. Uh, I, I like to have just a handful of slides really to kind of guide the discussion and then we can take it from there. I would like to start at least with a poll question to understand the, the nature of the audience right now. You know, what motivated you to attend today's webinar? So, Lo Rona, if you'll take care of launching that for us, please. Sure. So, Gil just asked to take a quick poll so we kind of know who he's addressing today. These answers will be anonymous, just an aggregate. But just go ahead and just tell us, what is it you hope to get out of today's session? Maybe you have an asset hierarchy, but it's just not, you're not achieving the results with it that you hoped. Or you're looking for ways to improve it. You have it, it's good, you want to make, make it even better. Or maybe um, you don't yet have a CMMS, but you want to learn more because you understand this is an important component of any implementation. All right, so it looks like we've gotten about 80% of the votes in. Thank you all for giving us your feedback. I'll leave it open a few more seconds. Oop, here comes a few more. All right, well, let me go ahead and share the results. And Gil, it looks like only 8% say my asset hierarchy is not serving me or it's broken. That's a good thing. 60% yep. are saying I'm looking for ways to improve it, continuous improvement. And then 32%, interesting, nearly a third are saying don't have a CMMS and uh, want to learn more about how what, how what they need to be thinking about asset hierarchies before they start down that path. All right, All perfect. Right. So, Actually, uh, very nice feedback. It gives me a chance to really think about how to set the stage on what we're going to cover here. So let's get started. So let's just start with a simple definition. Right out of the dictionary, let's talk about hierarchy. Uh, a noun, a system or organization in which people or groups are, are ranked. I added the, to think about the groups as assets. So you can think about how they're, they're ranked one above the other according to a status. And, you know, it's, with the synonyms to hierarchy, you know, is the pecking order, the ranking, the graduation or scale that you're using. In our equipment hierarchy, then a tractor vehicle is potentially two levels above the carburetor system. So it's just a matter of how we organize our assets. And as it applies to our assets, hierarchy is simply the relationship between the highest level of equipment and subordinate components. And oftentimes, you're going to hear this referred to as the parent-child relationship. In establishing a parent-child relationship, I, I, I looked out in, in industry and see what some of the other subject matter experts are saying. And Paul Lang from Life Cycle Engineering has this to say. He says, once developed, the asset hierarchy, the parent-child relationship, allows the end user to easily identify which assets are maintainable assets and which assets are considered bill of material assets. I like the concept of maintainable assets versus bill of material assets because we tend to overuse the word asset. We don't have a lot of other good words for that. Uh, equipment sometimes can even be misleading because not you know a room in a, in a factory can actually be an asset and you may want to charge work orders to a room. And so, uh, so assets the generic term and the bill of material assets are nothing more than to say, hey, these are all the things that we got going on in our factory. These are all the tangible pieces of things, uh, equipment, rooms, etc., that we can touch. But the maintainable ones is the ones that I'm after, the ones that I can actually perform maintenance and reliability uh, exercises on. So ISO 14224 illustrates how a parent-child relationship appears in a, in a py uh, pyramid taxonomy. Uh, and you'll notice that everything above the green line is location specific. Where am I? kind of uh, the question it answers. And you never can really answer with just one question. It could be a regional factory, so you do, and you don't want to lose sight of the fact that what region you're from. You, you may be a, a, a one building on a very large campus. Uh, it could be one installation of a particular type of, of process, uh, one plant. So, you know, there's no limit to how you define location. 
the taxonomy that you're looking at on the screen is really about kind of helping you think about that there is the highest level could be the industry as you work your way down to the plant level and then below that then you get into the system the equipment unit subunits and then you can have multiple levels of subunit and components and ultimately you're down to just parts and of course we don't typically do maintenance on parts we replace parts we inspect parts we uh, but there are some parts that, that and we'll talk about this um, in a few slides later of how they may actually fit into an asset hierarchy depending on whether you do a refurbishment or not on them But it's not just about reporting structure. I think it's important to recognize that if the hierarchy is not accurate, it's impossible to gain reliability, maintainability, the traceability of assets. You know, it's, it really boils down to how, how do planners, how can planners do their job if they're not aware of the plant's assets and how, and particularly, they relate to one another. So one of the ways that we like to also share the the idea of an art of a hierarchy is to look at location asset parts similar to the pyramid, uh, and you'll see that there's kind of a one for one. But we like to think about this uh, oftentimes as a stair step, how each one builds upon the other, so that I'm going down the steps, I'm getting more uh, closer to the lowest level of of component and as I go up the steps I'm getting more and more general in terms of categorization but then, then there are some little twists to this and this is where it gets fun take for example what about the electrical panel is it a location or an asset in your factory think about that for a second or what about a refurbished motor is it an asset or a part in your factory if you think about it, the simple answer is both. And really, it depends on what you're trying to answer and what you're trying to track. Uh, I have seen these answered in both manners, and neither one is right or wrong. But it does, it does require you as a maintenance professional to think about that. Because if you start categorizing some refurbished parts as asset and other refurbished parts as as, uh, as parts, then therein lies the problem with trying to understand what's happening in your, in your plants. When you start to run your reports, when you start to do your root cause analysis, when you start to identify what your total cost of ownership, that categorization will distort what you're looking at. And so uh, recently working with a, with a client of ours, uh, you know, we were talking about how parent relationship fits in, and if you don't have it, how it tends to then muddy the waters of, of what you've actually is going on in your factory. You may be able to understand fully what the cost total cost is, and at the financial level or at a controller level, that may be all they're interested in. But as a maintenance professional, when you're trying to make decisions about replace or repair, when you're trying to make decisions about uh, cost of ownership and what I can do to improve that, uh, you've got to have the details. And so the old adage that the devil's in the details is certainly plays out for us as, as maintenance professionals. So uh, think about that. The asset, the asset hierarchy is important for some basic fundamentals. Foundation of any CMMS initiative is to understand and manage and improve the company's performance. I always, I always like to tell, tell clients that, look, if we don't save you time, if we don't save you money, if we don't make things uh, improve performance for either from an uptime or downtime perspective, then our CMMS initiative is failing and we've done something wrong because it's not the goal of implementing software. It's the goal of improving asset performance. And it starts with this, this foundation of hierarchy. We can't deliver on, on the promise of, of improved cost if we don't have a good underlying hierarchical structure. With the right hierarchy in place, you can easily start to launch such initiatives uh, through, through RCM initiatives such as failure modes and effect analysis. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that one in a bit. You can do your root cause analysis because your root cause analysis is all going to come from your, uh, your, your work order environment. And if, you've, and if you've structured your asset to hierarchy correctly, your work orders are actually going to be the data that provides 
the analysis for where my where are my my problems coming from what is the root of the most expensive things that I do in this factory let's talk about some benefits and some very specific case by cases so case number one uh, a sound hierarchical asset structure is going to improve your scheduling of uh, preventive and predictive maintenance activities. Let's take, for example, a, a, a simple scenario. A planner is scheduling maintenance on a piece of equipment. Uh, this, is, this obviously has to be in the area of planning and scheduling. That means that you know it's coming up, it's an outage, uh, it's a PEM, whatever the case might be. But has the planner and scheduler taken the time to actually think that all the other assets associated with that equipment, such as gearboxes, instrumentation, safety valves, isolation points, are also candidates for maintenance while that equipment is offline? Why do we care? We care simply because it saves time, it saves money. It improves uptime because we can shut down a group once to do scheduling uh, maintenance versus uh, numerous shutdowns to do uh, maintenance on individual assets. Right. In a reactive maintenance environment, you have no choice but to do one thing at a time. But when you get out of the mode of, main, of reactive maintenance and you're more into a proactive maintenance, then you have time to think about this. Super important. It's where we see these tremendous case studies of radical changes to performance, such as going from 80% uh, uh, unplanned uh, reactive maintenance to 80% you know, planned maintenance and cost cutting in half. Uh, those are achievable type numbers and they come from being able to do at least something of this uh, on this order around planning and scheduling and making sure that I capture everything at one time. Now in a really uh, dynamic environment you may have uh, uh, unplanned events and, and most of you will tell me that that's probably just comes with the territory and I would tell you that even with those unplanned events if you have the right hierarchical structure it would only take a matter of seconds, not even minutes, but seconds to understand what other PMs are coming up that I can go ahead and get done while the equipment is down unplanned. Because I may have a number of PMs that are just sitting there waiting to be executed on, and so long as I know that they're in the queue and I'm not too far ahead of the game and costing myself uh, money in other, in other ways, I can kind of lump those together with an unplanned event so I can take at least try to take advantage of that unscheduled event happening prevent other downtime from future happening. Simple question. How would you do this without a relationship hierarchy? Now, I'm sure some of you are immediately thinking, well, I got a planner schedule that's been working for me for 20 years and he's got it all memorized. I would say, yep, that's right. Memor memorization. How about, uh, well, the, the, the operators in the area just know. Yeah, that's, that's true too. Tribal knowledge. The goal of any good maintenance program, however, is to take some of that tribal knowledge, to take some of that, that learned experiences and turn it into procedures and processes that are repeatable so that you get that regardless of whether that person's available or not, regardless of whether that person still works for you or not. You know, I always like to be the, the glass is half full and I always say, what happens when somebody wins the lottery and decides to move on? Uh, have you lost all that 20 years of learning? You know, shame on us if that happens to us because we kind of know that those days are, are not a matter of, uh, of, 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 of occurrence. It's just a matter of if and when. Let's look at a second benefit of establishing a sound hierarchical structure. The ability to charge costs at the lowest possible asset level suddenly becomes available to you. It provides a means to identify where your maintenance dollars are actually being spent. It gives you the ability to establish and write work orders to the correct asset level and not to a general level. I can't, uh, I can't tell you how many times I walk into a client's organization and find that they're, they're doing a great job of writing work orders. They're making sure that the, the technicians and, and so forth are, are not doing any work in the factory uh, without being able to charge it to a work order. And then when I sit down and evaluate their work orders, the work orders are being charged to an entire uh, location such as the mill or the uh, kitchen or you know this process A versus this process B and when you look at all those work orders in aggregate and sometimes there's hundreds if not thousands of them we can't tell which asset in that aggregate is actually driving the cost you have to sit literally sit down and look at one work order you know each one one at a time to evaluate and categorize it after the fact 
and most of you know, uh, been in your shoes, I understand what it's like, and there's no way that you're going to find the time to be able to do that after the fact. So the way you protect yourself is having your hierarchy up front so that your hierarchy provides that, that uh, uh, categorization breakdown for you. As I mentioned, it provides and develops the historical data. <clears throat> what you're ultimately looking to be able to do is, is have an analysis of repair or replace as opposed to just a debate, right? Too often times uh, we hear there's not enough money in the budget. I would tell you that in every case where I hear that, I already know that they're spending the money. It's just a matter of do you want to spend this much money on repair or do you want to spend this much money on replace? And, and there's not a controller in our systems anywhere that won't take the lower cost. So if we can show them with data as opposed to, to debate that we have a case for replacing this asset, they can find the money. There's no doubt in my mind because we're already spending it. Again, how would you do this without a relationship hierarchy? I've sat in those meetings as much as some of you, and it, and it really does become who's the most senior person in the room and whether or not somebody thinks that the budget is there. And really what they're telling you is not that the budget's not there. What they're telling you is that they don't trust or take your word for it that it's time to replace. I can hang on to that vehicle just one more year. right? I don't want to spend $50,000 to replace a generator. I'd rather just kind of limp along and let's put another 10, 15,000 in it this year to get it, you know, to keep it running. Let's look at a third one. Of uh, another uh, another uh, solid reason for why you want to have a hierarchical structure. It allows for something as simple as uh, failure mode and effective analysis. So what is FMEA? FMEA is a step-by-step -step approach for identifying all possible failures in, a, in an asset or service. So effectively you're asking yourself, what can go wrong? And that's your failure mode. And where's all this information going to come from? Looking at what defects and, 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 and issues have popped up in the past, it's your work order history. And if your work order history isn't providing you that information so that you can do a root cause analysis, then there's probably some opportunity for improvement. Hopefully you take a few ideas from this session and, and go and apply them and see what, uh, what, 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 your, what your work orders can, can do to help capture that information for you. The effects analysis part of this then refers to studying the consequences of those failures. So it, you don't do this in the work order environment, right? In the work order, you simply get the work done, get the asset back online, let's get production back up and running, and, and we move on to the next work order. But when a reliability engineer or maintenance engineer sits down and starts to look at, hey, where am I going to spend my limited budget for improvement this coming year? This is when they start to sit down and analyze the work order history and extract from that which of my assets are giving me the most trouble and extract from that what's the type of trouble that they're giving me so that I can understand what the effect is on, on overall cost. The general purpose of an FMEA then is to take action. Think maintenance plan to eliminate or reduce the failure. Can I do something to, to eliminate the fact that I get misalignment every time I uh, do a, j a job on this generator or this motor? Is there something that I can do to eliminate uh, the proper way to install a gasket so it doesn't leak after a PM? Uh, is there a, is there inspection that I can do to catch something from happening before it, it does a catastrophic failure? And once again, I ask you, how do you do this without a relationship hierarchy? And so the answer to these three is that it's very difficult and sometimes it's actually impossible. And without, without that hierarchy and you hit that, you hit that brick wall where you're trying to figure out how am I going to pull this information from work order history that's not broken down properly, then oftentimes it's just a matter, uh, there's just no time. It's a sink or swim, and so I've got to kind of just keep bailing water until I find uh, something else to do or some other solution comes along my way. So those are three very solid. There's more. But in, the, in light of what we're talking about here, I wanted to at least share those three versions of it. And I wanted to share with you also just a very simple FMEA because this tool, while it may sound a little bit intimidating at first, is actually a very simple, very powerful tool. And, and once you learn the, the basic uh, gist of how it works, um, it starts to give you insights 
And so I share with you a very simple, fun case here. It's just uh, I, I pulled this from uh, some samples that I found, and it's about uh, how an ATM uh, automatic uh, uh, teller machine might fail. And and what you're ultimately after, once you identify the failure and you identify the effect, you rank using your best judgment, using a team of subject matter experts in your factory, you rank the severity. And down on the, in the notes, you'll see there's a there's a scale there that tells you uh, it's a scale of one to ten, with the highest score uh, score being assigned to the to the highest impact. Then you as you assess where the problem is coming from and how frequently it might occur. And again, same kind of thing, a scale from 1 to 10, with 10 being the, the most frequently occurring and 1 being unlikely. And then, and then you look at detection, how easy it is to detect this, same kind of ranking, 1 to 10, with 10 being the easiest to rank, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, a failure event to get easily detected is, is a 10, and then a lower score is, is very difficult. And then you get this RPM index, and this RPM is a risk priority number. This risk priority number then gives you an opportunity to say, look, of all the things that I've identified, I'm going to go after the one that has the highest RPM number. And so the highest RPM number is, how, is, is the purpose of this analysis. All it's trying to do is help you understand and prioritize where am I going to go spend my dollars. So this is part of the slide deck that uh, you're more than welcome to share and use internally. Uh, it's for the purpose of helping educate and give you a chance to think about how an FMEA might happen. You can start to see how the work order history is going to feed the front half of this chart and, and then how your own uh, subject matter expertise and analysis is going to feed the back end and then the formality is to do the math and just let it tell you where, where's the best place to go spend your bucks. So assuming you're convinced that we need to do uh, have a good foundation of, a, of an asset hierarchy and, and you understand the basic principles of, 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 of what it can do for you, and of course now you're saying, hey, listen, Gil, I'd like to do this. I want to be sure that mine's in good shape, but where do I begin? Let's talk about a few places where you begin. I always like to say start with the end in mind. What would you want to know? What, what pieces of information in your factory are important to you so that you can make better, faster, smarter decisions? I'll give you a few feeders here. What is the total cost of ownership for a particular piece of equipment? See, just knowing that your maintenance budget is X dollars is not useful. So great, the controller cares that we spent X amount of money trying to run maintenance last year. What I care as a maintenance professional is how did that money get spent? What's the mean time between failure for a particular piece of equipment type? Same kind of principle here. I don't care what the mean time between failure is for my entire factory. That's just like the average of the averages. Again, another number that's kind of meaningless, like when you hear a statistics that say that the average family has 2.5 children. It's just the center of gravity, right? It's just a mean, an average of an average. What I'd like to really know that's meaningful to me is what's the mean time between failure for that particular piece of equipment or for a particular piece of equipment that, that I group by process or similarities of that nature. What about the mean time to repair between similar equipment but different manufacturers? Isn't that what mo automobile manufacturers tend to tell us in, the, in their commercials? That the total cost of ownership or, their, or the frequency in the, in, the, in the repair shop is lower for one type of vehicle versus another? That's all they're talking about. They understand that it's a differentiating uh, feature to have vehicles and equipment that is less in the shop than others. Do you have that going on? Was there a decision made in your past where they changed model numbers because they want to save a few bucks on buying uh, the other brand and suddenly you've got two types of uh, motor types in your, in your factory and they're probably giving you a different motor performance but you really can't tell unless you have them broken down in a hierarchy that captures those motors that are from manufacturer A versus those motors that are from manufacturing B. What child component is creating the most unplanned downtime? Simple. A good place to start is always with who's creating the most problems. And as we talked about in the simple example, I got an outage coming up. What equipment should be included in that outage? What PM should I pull in? What PM should I push out so that I get them all done in that, in that three-day outage, for example, so that I'm not having to take other downtimes outside of that outage and, and actually improve my uptime as opposed to impact it negatively. And my favorite, 
it's the way you do break-even analysis for repair or replace. I, 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 as I've said earlier, uh, too often times as maintenance professionals, we hear the words from our from our finance team, there's no budget. There's no budget for that. Sure, I get it that there's no budget set aside specifically targeted to replace that piece of equipment, but what they're not what what I always tell my maintenance professionals is that they're not telling you that the money's not already there. You're already spending it in most cases. You're just trying to decide how much am I going to spend? Am I going to spend X amount repairing it or am I going to spend X amount replacing it? And oftentimes the replace is lost because we don't have good hierarchical setups in order to drill down and understand what the cost is. So those are some of the questions that I would challenge you to think about, to ask yourself as you prepare to do your, uh, to, to, to examine your existing hierarchies. Or if for those of you that are just launching your CMS, it's certainly something to think about as you plan uh, your asset uh, data collection and the attributes that you're going to build around that. Another component then is start off with looking at your building diagrams. Simple, simple view. Look at the domain. What's the natural grouping? Who are the power sources? What electrical panels do things report back to? Uh, you know, what's the natural geograph uh, geography that's driving some of your decisions? And then break that geography down further into sub some components of that rooms within within a building assets within the room components to those assets uh, so I always found that starting with a with a building diagram is a nice simple way of, of getting a good uh, structure starting a good structure go take a look at the pyramid the pyramid is a nice guideline uh, it is not your answer but it certainly gives you some hierarchical thinking and, and but don't stop there Right, because the pyramid itself, well, it's it's very difficult to actually show all the branches. Right, if you think of that pyramid as just a a one one up one down relationship, then you're probably going to go down the wrong path. There are literally branches of things, and that's why sometimes I like the ladder because the ladder helps you think about, oh, I can actually take off in this direction. When I start thinking about things such as, I'm also interested in identifying similar assets, so that would be like an asset class or assets from the same manufacturer as I gave you an example earlier, or assets with similar power consumptions uh, or, co or power ratings. And, you know, and, you, and the list goes on and on. You can start to think about uh, the things that affect the way you operate. Think about what's, what's been your budget busters in the past year or two. Uh, what are some of the biggest surprises where you scratch your head at the end of that uh, event and said to yourself, man, I hope I don't have to live through another one of those. Those are all excellent places to start thinking, gather all that knowledge, gather all that experience, and then start to build your structure, asset uh, structure from there. I'm more than happy and always, and always tell you know, if, if, uh, clients, look, let's just start with a simple one. Let's look, let's look at uh, uh, asset name. Let's, let's set up a parent-child relationship, so we're going to have a, pass, a parent asset, a parent asset ID. I, I know asset type is important. There might be other asset type categories, so we might have more than one of these, and we have to give them different names so they're meaningful to us, and we have to kind of control the data that gets in there because we don't want to have pump entered as PUMP, and then in another, and then someone later comes and sets up an asset and enters it as uh, PMP or you know suction system because then they're not the same asset type anymore. And, and so, you know, misspellings and control of language and naming conventions is important. And you can control that for yourself by having uh, one system admin that takes care of setting up assets. Uh, but here's a simple structure to just begin with. I think manufacturer is a huge uh, deal. Uh, model numbers and serial numbers sometimes help because the model numbers will tell you about recalls and other things of that nature. And of course, the standard kind of stuff of location, room level, all, all play a part. If you even just start with this, you'll very quickly start to identify other things for yourself as well. Here's one that I, I worked on recently and I kind of changed some of the uh, the identifiers so that it doesn't necessarily identify the, the, the company. But at a minimum, you want to be sure that you've got your parent grouping. You want to be sure that you have uh, some kind of child specific assets. And the one thing that oftentimes gets lost, and I would tell you that you ought to go back and look at your assets today and see if this is the case, 
is is to have a child miscellaneous. One of the uh, one of the important things about structuring your assets is that you want to charge uh, uh, work order, labor, and parts to the lowest possible level. If you start down a path of mixing that, where you have some child assets that get work orders charged against them, and then you have some parent assets that also get charges put against them, it'll start to create noise and confusion in managing the data. Your reports will be a little bit more challenging to run. And, it's, it, and, and it can hide information if you're not careful. So generally what I drive to do is I don't want any charges to a parent level. Once we've identified that this is a parent, there's never a work order that can be written against that parent. It can only be written to children of that parent. So the very natural thing that happens is, well, what happens, uh, Gil, when we don't have an asset that's uh, child identified? Do I keep adding children every time I do work? And the answer is no. In fact, I want to try to drive to the to the smallest number of assets possible while still having the breakdown down to the lower components that I can. So you throw so you create this miscellaneous child. There's one miscellaneous child per parent, and you put all other all other components that you hadn't thought about, you put them into the into this miscellaneous category. What does that do for you? It gives you a, a collection point. Whenever you do your Pareto analysis, you're doing your root cause analysis, if miscellaneous starts to pop up as an, as, as an important category, then you dive deep into miscellaneous and see what's happening there. Generally speaking, what's going to happen is you're going to identify that, oh, here's another asset, here's another child asset that we need to extract. Well, at that point, it's really easy to extract it, rename it, pull it out of miscellaneous, and then and now you're, you're, you're off and running. It's the danger of capturing miscellaneous peanut butter spread over everything that hides it from you. So I'd rather see a miscellaneous category that starts to build history than to find out that sometimes it's charged to the parent, sometimes it's charged to the room, sometimes it's charged to the component right next to it because we don't have a child asset that's specifically set up. And I've, I've come across that, and, it, and it's a great deal of work to un, unravel it. Uh, I once spent a, a significant amount of time with a client trying to help them unravel there so that we could get up to a, a more useful, friendlier asset structure with a parent-child type relationship. And the main thing we ended up introducing was a miscellaneous child. So in summary, begin with the end in mind. Like I said earlier, what questions uh, are important to you? What type of, of, of data would you like to have to be able to do analysis? Set up your specific asset hierarchy. Make sure it's, it's not a cut and paste from anybody. Make sure it's, uh, there's some thought put into why it makes sense for your organization. And then monitor the asset performance. Because I'll tell you, the, the, it's sometimes an iterative process. And it's, if you set up your hierarchy and immediately within a month or two of runtime, start trying to run reports. Start asking your, get in a room with a group of subject matter experts and say, okay, what's important as well? I'd like to know what the mean time you know, to repair is for, for all the motors in the, mill, in the mill house. And if you can't answer the question with just a few keystrokes, then you've probably missed something in your, in your asset structure. And there's time to go back and fix that. So by monitoring the asset performance, you'll, you'll immediately start to identify for yourself whether or not you've got a good asset structure and it's supporting the kind of uh, questions you have and answers that you're looking for. Once, once you're happy with the setup and once you see that the assets are, are, are speaking to you in terms of being able to monitor them, then you want to prioritize your improvement areas. Use the root cause analysis to, to to whittle down to the to the few that are driving cost in your factory, and then do an FMEA on those. You know that FMEA exercise. While it looks like a lot of sometimes mumbo jumbo, I'm gonna tell you that it would probably wouldn't take a a, a couple hours of a few subject matter air, uh, experts in your area to try to piece it together, and you'd be surprised at the conversation discussion that comes out of it and the genuineness of the of the brainstorming that you'll get. And it takes takes some of the emotion out of it. Right. What you don't want is, is decisions about replacing or repairing assets to be strictly an emotional-based decision. So there you have it. 
those are the items that I think are important to setting up an asset structure. Uh, as, I, as I said, it's it's not a difficult concept. It's but but there, but as I've learned throughout the years, I, I will tell you that in in a vast majority of the cases, when I go into a client site, it's it's where I start. It's where my team of subject matter experts, consultants start, and and I'm going to tell you that in a very very high majority of the cases, we find that the asset structure is lacking. Uh, of course, the worst case is where there's not a good one that serves any any purpose at all. Uh, but in most cases, there's a there's some thought already put into it, and it just needs a little bit of tweaking. And uh, so, with that, I'll open it up to questions, Rona. All right, thanks, Gil, for providing that. It was a really good high-level overview, and uh, which did, of course, uh, prompt a lot of questions. So again. We'll, uh, if you would like to type those in, we'll try to get to as many as we can in the remaining time. Um, Gil, can you tell us, we have a, a listener who is dealing in an environment, in a distributed environment with multiple locations, and do you have any thoughts or rule of, rules of thumb when you are dealing with assets that are distributed across multiple plants and have different owners on uh, best practices regarding standardizing those? Sure, Rona. Thank you. Thank you for that question. So that's a really good, very special case. And if, and uh, let's uh, let's just do, uh, let me leave it up on the screen here, so it kind of uh, serves as a good uh, background for us. I think the important part of this is that you think about you spend a little bit more time breaking down the assets by by thinking about location, and then I would add to the mix think about compliance. Where are the safety points? Where are the environmental compliance points? So that these categorizations also exist within the structure. So that when you when you evaluate uh, how well are we doing, uh, that we can tell how the entire system is performing, and not necessarily just get so focused on one geographical area versus another. So. Uh, I'm happy to have uh, more depth of discussion for for those uh, if somebody wants to reach out, but uh, but uh, not knowing the specifics, uh, I think uh, the simple answer is look beyond just location, group things by process or environmental process, and and particularly bring the compliance component into it so that you can answer your questions as an aggregate. And safety, good point. Um, one listener said that they do a lot of outsourcing of their maintenance and contract work. And what are your recommendations regarding when um, you know you're using a lot of outside contractors? This listener is asking, does the contract itself become the parent asset, and now you group the child for all the assets that they are maintaining? Have you um, do you have any thoughts, skill on best way when you have outsourced or you know particular craft? that right. works on certain assets, how you might group them? I actually would not deviate from, from the basic concept that I want to track and organize my assets internally. Right? So I don't so let's let's talk about the two a little bit separate. I, I want to have a good asset structure that tells me how my plant is operating. At this point in the discussion, I really don't care who does the work, okay? I just want to be sure that I have a structure that tells me this is what's happening in my factory. These are the pieces of equipment that we maintain, and this is how they, the relationship between each other. Now let's talk about who maintains them. The work order itself is where I'm going to track this. I want to know work orders. You know, think about work orders as either being internal or external. So an internal work order is to my own maintenance staff, and they've already been told that it's a condition of employment to be sure that they don't do any work in the factory that's not being tracked on a work order, so that their labor charges are true, so that their material charges are true, and there's a work order for everything that we do internally. Now apply the very same principle to your contractors. They need to do charge all their work order, all the work that they do when they come into your plant has to be traceable to the asset that they did the work on. So while there may be an overarching contract that talks about, you know, they do all the plumbing services or they do all the HVAC services or they may do all the yard work maintenance for us, uh, they still owe you. And and quite honestly, I've been in, in situations where we build it into the contract with the with the uh, with the with the contract service provider that says, as a condition of this contract, you will provide us 
work orders uh, complete it with the with the specific asset, the amount of labor, and the amount of parts that were consumed. Because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen someday. One day you're going to want to do an analysis about whether or not you're getting your money's worth on that on that external service. You know, nothing stops you from considering whether or not there's a value to your company of bringing an outside contract service in. And by the way, it cuts both ways. There may be a there may be a contractor who, if I know the cost. If I know my true cost of ownership or my true cost of delivering a service internally, let's say, for example, a fleet manager who has a lot of vehicles and they have their own garage on site and they're considering outsourcing that garage. Well, if I can actually track and, 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 and provide evidence of what my internal cost is for managing my garage and I can div and divide it by the number of vehicles I've got, I can tell what the cost per vehicle is. Then I can go and have an outsource uh, organization bid on, on the work and see if their bid is better than my internal cost. So it cuts both ways, but I think the important thing to recognize is you don't want to, you, you, the, the, the contract itself is not the asset. The assets are still the equipment that they're maintaining uh, inside your plant. It's a matter of what the work order charges look like. So when I filter uh, against a particular vendor provider, service provider, and I look at how much work they have done, I want to see work order history for everything they've provided and I, and I want to see the, the amount of labor that went into those work orders, and I want to see the kind of parts that they consumed. Because at the end of the day, we all know that regardless of who does the work for us, we're paying for it, right? And with an outside service, we kind of made the decision that, well, I don't have the wherewithal to manage that kind of craft internally, so I'm, so I'm, providing, I'm, I'm, I'm contracting it externally, and, and, as, and you know well that that, that that contract provider is going to charge you a profit, and so you're making a decision that it's, it's still better for you to pay someone with profit externally than to do it internally is just cost. Don't lose sight of the asset structure and then just track your contractors to work orders. To work orders or perhaps using projects or work order types to group your work orders by contract. Okay, good good point. Um, we have a long-standing e-mint client, uh, I'd like to say hello to who asked this question. But um, in the case where uh, you have plants that are merging, let's say through an acquisition, and you have, you're merging two plants, and they currently have two totally different asset numbering schemes. Not that that would ever happen, right? Never, never. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this relates a little bit in the multi-location. What, um, what do you suggest? What are some good rules of thumb there when you're starting with two very different systems? And, you're, and I suppose this could also, if, listeners out there today have a system that's broken. How do you go about changing it? How do you go about integrating it to get it where it needs to be? So, so always a fun project. I would, I would immediately tell you that recognize that this is not a project of maintenance necessarily, but it's a, it's a, it's a change man, cultural change management project, in which case you're going to need to have a very good facilitator that can bridge gaps, find consensus, and help the people see how reaching uh, a decision uh, is, is useful to everybody in the room. Because the challenge is that everybody's going to come in with a, with a predetermined position that says, my way is better than your way. And, and, and that always makes for very difficult, challenging discussions because when you start talking about asset structures, you literally may have to make a decision about whether or not you call it a, a, a vacuum system or whether you call it a pump. And I said, well, we've called it a pump for 20 years. I don't really care to change. And they're going to say the same thing about a vacuum system. And, and so somewhere there's going to be, need to be some compromise. And this is why I say a facilitator, an unbiased facilitator is going to be really important in helping reach some of these conclusions and actually stair-step the organization in, into how you meld. Now, the simple thing is you just got to have to line everything up side by side maybe put it all in one big file so that everybody can see all the data at one time and start to look for the differences. You may actually find out that there's only a few places that differ. And when it's naming convention and it's really about just the a asset identification, those generally are not points of contention. Uh, and so you kind of blow through those pretty quick. The where you're going to run into points of contention is uh, asset types because people are so used to calling something one way versus another. And of course, how many asset types you might have. People tend to group things sometimes differently than other locations might want to group them. So, so uh, not a, there's, there's no simple way. It's, it's a lot of hard work when you start to uh, 
combine two factories. Uh, my my take on it is uh, I've been down through 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 a couple of those kind of changes, and the most important thing that we did when we did it right was that we had a we had an unbiased uh, project manager who was an excellent facilitator and was able to navigate those tricky uh, discussion points. And ultimately, there's got to be someone that can make a decision, and everybody sticks with it. There you go. It's good. It's good project management at the end mm, of the day. Exactly um, right. You mentioned about the RPNs, you know, kind of that priority in that example, Gil. And we have somebody asking us, how do you um, apply those to help prioritize work so that uh, the maintenance technicians can use those to kind of, well, he says, pick and choose their own work orders intelligently. How do you? How have you seen those applied? Is it a priority code, a rhyme code? You know, what ways, once they kind of compute this, can they use that to help prioritize the work in the plans? So, so let's. Uh, let, we need to kind of separate some of the, the activity here. If you're talking about prioritizing work orders, then most likely your RPMs not gonna not gonna fit into that thinking. What's gonna fit into that thinking is okay. more of your your rhyme. Uh, your risk uh, in, investment the number uh, think about it this way it's the critical equipment gets gets you know gets the first priority and so any anything that you've decided is critical and there is a criticality peak component to assets that we didn't talk about it fits really in a different subject it's not so much a hierarchy as it is now once you've completed your hierarchy you've got to ask yourself which which parent equipment or which parent categories or which components are critical enough that they might affect immediately affect safety, immediately affect quality of product, or immediately create process shutdown if they if there's a if there's a failure or a or a problem with that component. Those get the highest criticality. Then the next level is what happens after a few hours and they start to affect uh, pr you know productivity, safety, or quality, uh, and then. Which are those that you don't really care? They can, like a printer on a on a line, can run to failure. It only takes me a few minutes to replace it, and I'm just and it's not going to create any safety hazards, so, uh, you know, product quality issues or things of that nature. So therefore, uh, I'll wait till it fails, and that's a good strategy for something like that. And those are the lowest uh, criticality. And so when you go through this criticality analysis and you've categorized everything as high, medium, low, or one, two, three, or A, B, C, whatever makes sense to you, and then and then and then what you're going to apply for your for your technicians is H. So the oldest work orders that are of the highest critical equipment get prioritized first. So even a low priority piece of equipment will eventually bubble to the top if it goes unattended to very long. And that's how you that's how you will drive your work order prioritization for your mechanics and technicians that are out there actually trying to get the work done. This RPN, if you'll notice in the in a failure modes and effect analysis, it's really uh, just a multiplier of severity, frequency of occurrence, and the ability to, to to detect it. So the highest possible score you get on an RPN is 10 times 10 times 10 or a thousand. And, and the RPN number in an FMEA is really helping the reliability engineer or maintenance engineer uh, trying to decide where am I going to go concentrate some, some energy, effort, and potential investment to improve and try to get that number reduced. So you ask yourself, if I was looking at ATM pin authentication and I notice that I'm working, I'm going to work, just for argument's sake, I'm going to go work on that number uh, RPN 72, the very first one in the row. Well, I can see already that I've made a determination that a severity is an eight, frequency is a three, and detection is a three. My biggest bang for the buck on that particular line item is to try to go figure out how to reduce the severity. So how can I get eight to be a three, right? And that would knock 72 down to 27. And so if you look down at the dispense cash, and the second one from the bottom, it kind of has a similar breakdown as well, right? It's a, it's a 96. And and I, and very obviously, if I can work on uh, severity, uh, the other the other two aren't going to drive that number. And if I look at the highest one, the 196, it says that I have to not only work on severity, but I also have to work on on the frequency of occurrence. How do I prevent that from happening? And as you ask yourself, how do I turn seven into two? How do I turn eight into one? You're going to start. You're literally asking yourself. What is the maintenance plan that I'm going to put in place 
to make that happen. And so that's the difference between an FMEA, which is really about trying to improve the reliability of the asset versus work order management, which is about what's the most critical of the work orders that I have right now to try to drive, you know, make sure the plant doesn't shut down on me. That's a great way to look at it and to differentiate the two. Uh, thanks for clarifying that. All right, to be respectful of everyone's time, there are so many questions, but I'll uh, we'll just have time for one more. And um, Gil, for somebody getting started, uh, you know, there's different ways. You've kind of given us now the theory, and as they go to apply it and they're setting this up to the first time, there's there's different styles. Um, alphameric or you know whatever you want to call it do you have a particular if someone wants to get started what's the most common or the easiest style of taxonomy that kind of helps you get started and allows for the future alpha numeric you know how would you any uh, any thoughts about that if someone now wants to start applying this sure paper there's there's one thing in particular that I that I that I warn people against all the time. Be careful in your asset tag in that in that unique identifier, that very first one on this list, to not put a lot of intelligence into that. And what I mean by this is we're all familiar with the with the vehicle identification number, the VIN. Those VINs have history back when automobiles were first being manufactured, and every digit in that VIN means something. But think about where we're at today in our taxonomy and the ability of our technology. Everybody's got smartphones. Everybody's got laptops. The technology today doesn't require us to try to use every single digit to mean so much. We can use fields in our, in our CMMS to create the different layers of taxonomy, so to speak. So uh, what happens when you start to put too much uh, intelligence into your asset tag is you start to lock yourself in. And I've had the personal experience of finding out, you know, a couple years into the game that the that the original uh, identification tag ID naming convention that we created wasn't serving us for some of the future assets and some of the future uh, uh, factories that we started up. And I and I had to go through a significant exercise to redo that. So what I try to do is put as little intelligence into the tag. Maybe the first digit means something, and then the next six are just nothing but uh, uh, sequential. And what I look for is I'm looking for parent groupings. I'm looking for asset types. Because imagine if all my energy is put into asset types, and all of a sudden, here comes a new asset into the factory. We introduce a new process, buy a whole bunch of equipment, put it in place, and then I'm looking at my asset hierarchy and I say, wow, I really don't have an asset type to fit that. And I say, no biggie. What do you want to call it? And we'll add it at that point, and, and, and you're off and running. And so the energy is in the other fields, not in the asset tag identifier. And so that's the, the, the one caution I have. Everything else, there's not a preference for alpha or numeric. Uh, like I said, my, my, my key takeaway in, in my experiences, my personally and with clients, is try not to put too much asset, uh, I mean, uh, uh, put too much um, intelligence uh, into the unique ID number unless you've already got a structure that is very well vetted. And I've seen some very good ones and I wouldn't have touched them. Uh, or change them for the world because the company had done an excellent job of really vetting how they were going to build their asset tags and it worked beautifully. But for those of us that are just starting, put more of your energy into uh, into your uh, asset types and your uh, your parent identifications and things like that, and 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 less into the asset tag ID. Beautiful. Okay, that's a good note to end on. It's all about the attributes <laughs> and. Uh, well, thank you, Gil, so much for sharing your thoughts today. Um, I hope I, I know I learn a lot on all of these sessions, and uh, we hope our listeners did as well. And um, so I'd like to thank Gil for taking time out of his day, and the same to all of our listeners. And I would like to ask uh, you all to take a moment when we end the webinar and let us know how we did. We know you're all at different points in your journey and just too basic, too much information, too little. What else is on your mind that we can present to you? You know, Gil and his team obviously have a wealth of experience that they're willing to share and uh, your input and feedback is really valuable. So thanks again to Gil and thanks to our listeners and uh, everyone have a good day and we'll see you all the next time. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.